Hello, everyone. In this session, From Plazi to Taxon Works, we started it off with a poll asking about everyone's familiarity with Plazi. Here, we share the results of said poll uh, so you can get a, a feel uh, for who the audience was that day. Oh, welcome everybody, welcome back. And this will be a quick uh, tour through what we explored. We, that's Jim Willie, say hi, Jim. Hi. <laughs> and, and myself uh, exploring the Plazi treatment data set for a given paper and what we, how we could use it uh, to help get names into a Taxon Works database. And we're joined by Donat Agosti from Plazi and Julia Yora, if she can join us, but they're currently struggling with um, floods in Brazil. Many of us can relate that we have lots of names, lots of taxon names. We either need them for our research, uh, they're tied up in documentation that we have a hard time getting access to, uh, or we need to update what we have. So in this case, we're using this paper as a key example uh, in what we might be able to do to help make it a little faster. Jim? So uh, thank you, Debbie. Uh, I just uh, want to say a couple of words about the Universal Calcidoidia database, uh, which I'm representing here. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, uh, this was a basically a lifetime uh, uh, work of uh, John Noyes at, at a Natural History Museum in London. And then when he retired in 2019, we ported it to Taxon Works. Uh, it took a while to get it running. Uh, we started out, we had a ba backlog of something like 300 uh, papers with uh, with taxonomic uh, actions in them that uh, we, we needed to curate. And so we now have a team of people that uh, is, is, is working on a biweekly basis. We have these meetings, uh, we call barbecues that uh, where we, uh, maybe a group of, you know, three to six people get together and we curate papers and solve problems together, et cetera. And we're just about caught up with the with the taxonomic, you know, we're something like five papers uh, behind right now. But a, a major challenge for us are large monographs like uh, this one by Krister Hansen and Paul Hansen on the genus Galeopsomaya. There were 302 new species here and, uh, you know, we had already done one big monograph by John Noyes with an, probably just about the same number of new species. Pamela Sagai in Brazil and I did it, you know, one species at a time, key punching in all the information. It took it took weeks and months of, of work. And uh, so uh, Natalie Dale Sky in London had already started entering some of these species by hand, but Debbie came up with the, the brilliant suggestion of why don't we see if we can use a plazi treatment, uh, you know, to to sort of semi-automate uh, this this process of of just getting the names into into the UCD. And I think that's all I need to say, Debbie. Are you going to take it over now? I that's am. It. That was your opportunity that's to right. frame the conversation. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, back to Debbie. So currently, uh, to fill you in on the background, there are several ways to get names in. One, of course, would be an automated script if we're merging a very large data set into TaxonWorks. There are one by, there's a one by one method that Jim was referring to. And Jim, can you refresh how long you said it takes to enter sort of all the data for a name? About five minutes. Or for a name, for all the data, yeah. Yeah. Um, we have two different batch uploaders. And we have a new, thanks to uh, Dash Peters and this checklist uh, importer that I thought we ought to try using the Plazi output. So briefly, can Plazi treatment data sets help us? What does Plazi do? Essentially, they take uh, data that has been published in a paper, the kind uh, of, that Brian Fisher referred to in his talk, can we pull data out of that and structure it in such a way uh, that we can do things like get names to go directly into the GBIF backbone, or in our case, see if we could use what Plazi does when they take this paper 
and break it down into its components, um, can we use that information to populate uh, taxon works? And I can put this link in the chat in a minute. Inside this file that we downloaded from Plazi, we get all these different files. We were interested in this one, taxa.txt, which includes things like the accepted name usage ID, uh, the scientific name, the authorship, kinds of things we would want to import into TaxonWorks. So essentially, we were able to add 300 names in a total of about five minutes. And these are the fields that we used to do that. Uh, we, so you can see here, there's just not that many fields to just get the new species names in. There, are, there is some work that we had to do, uh, and we can talk more about that with time for questions. Uh, I just want to emphasize that, one, we were really excited to get it to work. I know Jim was. <laughs> and this gives us the sort of impetus to move forward to talk about the next steps. So on that, what did we do? We did a very human-mediated process. We reached out to Plazi, said, Plazi, we have this big paper. Can you help us? We got permission from the authors. The author said, yes. Plazi did their magic to create structured data from this paper, gave it back to the humans, us. The humans took the structured data, got it out into the spreadsheet that we needed in order to get it into taxon works. Right? So that's what we did. What we'd like to do next, of course, is connect our user interface through the taxon works API to the Plazi API and be able, to, the human, to sort of ping Plazi, for example, get data from Plazi back into TaxonWorks. And ideally, in the future, and Donat will speak more to this, uh, humans would publish their paper and the structured data already in such a format uh, so that it's ready to be ingested in such places um, at the same time. Matt, is there anything you want to add to that? No, I think that's, I think it's a good point. I think this, there's a lot behind this story mm -hmm. that, that's going on there. And I think it's really an ongoing um, research area, right? To, to take advantage of the intersection between the human curated level of data that is going but on and has gone on for decades at the UCD and the automated approach that Plazi is giving us. And we really want to see if we can close that gap in the long term so that, like you said, that when new names are, are worked up and proposed in taxon works in the course of a taxonomic treatment, that Plazi doesn't have anything to do, right? We submit that structured data in the long run and it it follows sort of the ideals and the, and the standards and the, and the goals of Plazi's work. Uh, that's definitely in the vision of taxon works in the long run to facilitate creating structured data as we do the science that we're doing. And um, I want to, I'd say, like watching this process from behind the scenes, Debbie did a whole ton of work to take that taxa file and put it in the context of what's uh, a uh, rapidly evolving import tool in taxon works. Um, so we can't overlook that. And that took a lot of time. A lot of the things we think about are efficiency related. Um, when data come into taxon works, they're viewed by human eyes. And there's a lot of quality assurance checking that happens at that stage. And what I guess one of the underlying questions here is um, what steps can we confidently kind of skip? And where do we want more human eyes to to spend their time? How do we make the human input more valuable in that process? Um, and I think this was a really nice experiment for that. I do think that moving forward, we can do a lot of things hopefully without, and we've, we're aware of this, we just haven't had the time or the real focus to implement these tools. We're aware of Plazi's APIs and the fact that they can change. So for example, rather than requiring that taxa.txt file, can we get the raw data in the user interface and it will just like look like it appears there and then you'll make your decisions 
to import those names, clicking through one at a time or accepting all of them. Um, but that kind of magic can't happen without these experiments that connect the low level um, processes, the human process, the taxa parsing process of Plasi. So um, I, think, I think this was a really great um, illustration of forcing the intersection by, by running the experiment and just doing it, right? That has to happen before we can make the magic happen. And I would just add quickly, and then it's Plazi's turn, that the other thing I, I hope it does, and for Jim, this is for you in the UCD, is give you a taste of that actual next step so that you are encouraged to both know what, even what you can push for, right, when you realize what we were able to do. So with well, that. We're definitely, at the UCD, we're definitely very excited about this, uh, this process. The only other thing I would like to say is that you know, yes, once Debbie had the, the matrix, you know, the, the, the spreadsheet massaged in the correct format, we uploaded 300 names in five minutes, but uh, there was hours and hours of work, uh, primarily by Debbie. Uh, I tried to help out a little bit and not screw things up uh, that, that it took to get to that point, so. But it won't take, a, it won't take hours next time. No, 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 we have a, we have a working model now. So, exactly. you know, exactly. that was a big achievement. All right, so thank you for listening to our experiments and hopefully you can relate to parts of it as you try to move names around in your world or access them. And now we're going to hear a little bit more for those of you who are about, know about Plaza, you'll learn a bit more. And for those of you who don't, you'll get an introduction to who Plaza is and what they do. Well, welcome to everybody and thanks <clears throat> to Texan Work to invite us to give a presentation here and give us some comments. Um, Yes, it's actually interesting to see the last slide Matt and Deb provided is essentially that's like our future is to not do what we do, but let's publish properly. But we still have a backlog of something like 500 million pages. And I think Jim has something like 24,000 publications he probably wants to process. And I'm not sure how many new publications he gets every year. And we which have to go through the tedious process of extracting data from publications. And I will talk about this now. Unfortunately, uh, Judah can uh, join because of climate change and all of that. They, they have a, a massive flooding in, in southern Brazil. So they are really cut off, which is really sad. But I hope all the best that, this is, that they get back on normal track soon. So, Plaz is a Swiss NGO. It's in Switzerland because of copyright reasons and mainly. So, and you will find out probably a bit more later. <clears throat> and the goal is to discover known biodiversity. So we want to actually know how many species have been described and not so much as a team wants to find out how many species that are out there. And they want to find out what we know about these species. So we don't want just a list of species, but we want all the knowledge about this too. So very interested in digital accessible knowledge. And that's something we need to discuss because for us, we have an understanding, but this collaboration with Texan work is exciting because they might have a slightly different view of what digital accessible knowledge uh, comprises. And we are really much, very much interested in the future of publishing. So we are actively working with Pensoft and the CETOF working group to create the next generation of publications, which would allow the same direct import of published data into your databases. So what we do, we take PDFs, we call this like the, essentially the PDF prison, often unfortunately in our community closed access publications. We make fair data, so we take data out and we do that and show that we actually do it is that, and we do it in a way right is that uh, GBIF is using all our data immediately. So within a couple of minutes after data went through our process, it shows up in GBIF. And we demonstrate, we have some tools like Ocellus, which allows you to, to uh, browse and search through the images we, or figures we, we uh, explore. Or we have Synospecies, a tool that allows you to explore all the, the, the treatment citations essentially synony synonymous in, in this in, uh, hidden in these publications. 
More recently, we started to work with Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics and to build the biodiversity PMC, which is a really cool thing and you should watch because it allows you to do a lot of, of um, data mining and use AI tools to actually make use of all the, the treatments we liberate. The Biotic Explorer is one tool which allows to figure out like biotic interactions hidden in these publications and, public, and essentially interactions you normally do, extract by hand. So we take a PDF, we have the, the treatment bank factory in the middle, and then we make data fair, and we have some tools to watch of them. And when you say we liberate data, means we extract a P from a PDF metadata, we put the PDF in a form we can read this and ref we get ref bibliographic references out, the images or figures, the tables, taxonomic treatments, material citations. So these are, in, in a nutshell, the, the elements we extract. And currently, we have uh, something like over 900,000 treatments extracted. We did include something like 140,000 new species, 1.5 million uh, uh, material citations. That means citations of materials in specimens you digitized in your collections, something like half a million figures. We run currently something like 150 journals on a regular base for which you have templates, and templates you need to process them automatically. Do individual extractions for publications that are hard to automate. We do a lot of quality control and, and we disseminate state. For that, we develop Golden Gate, a tool that allows to, to open up and convert a PDF that you see, like the one we, <clears throat> we've been talking before, and then do all these annotations. So at the end, it looks something like this. We have like all this like a huge set of annotations in the publications. We know where treatments are and begin. We have taxonomic names. We have figures, figure captions, we have bibliographic references, and so on. Then we take this and disseminate the data in the biodiversity literature repository. In, when we talk about fair data, here's a very good example of fair data. That means we take this data, figures, and, and treatments out of publication, make them findable, so accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So everybody can come in and find them. All of these publications, they, they have a DOI. Oops, you can't see it here, but they all have a DOI, so we can properly cite them. Currently, there are like 100,000, been more than 100,000 publications there. There are treatments, like of more than half a million, and there are like over half a million figures. Part of these publications are includes, for example, uh, Texodros, that's the older publications, 19,000 publications, which are used for um, Texodros, the, the database for um, root flies. And you could well imagine that some of you might have an interest to collaborate, to add your data into Seno to create your community and start to extract all data from that place. A little bit where we, our impact or footprint is we, we, we get publications here, we process them, make them fair, and then we disseminate. So originally we, we talked to biodiversity institutes like GBIF, we talked to, um, then to the Catalog of Life and Checklist Bank, but we are more open. So we extract, uh, export data, the wiki data. And more recently, we really have a big export of data into the life sciences like uh, uh, NCBI or, or biodiversity. So the data means data we liberate, and that's you have to keep in mind, it's not just one thing you do for a particular purpose, but once it's liberated, it can be reused in many different ways. So now data access, and that's the important point for you. So data can be accessed in different ways. So you can search, there's, uh, um, there are different ways to access that. So there is a normal search. You can do an extended search. You can search for taxonomic names or bibliographic data or material citations. So this is the ordinary search. Then we have um, statistics or like uh, an interface which allows you to, to build queries and search through almost all the elements we annotate. And you see there's a lot of, of um, uh, annotations, annotation types we do. But you also provide some statistics, 
Plus, you also provide links to external sources. So, for example, if you upload a a um, stream to to Chibif, then it has then it, it has here the ID that Chibif issues for this particular treatment or data set. So it, you really can also explore what is known about this taxon. Then we the the data you get from this uh, table. You can export in HTML, CSV, TSV, or other formats. And you can also, what you did, ex ex uh, get a Darwin Core archive. And the Darwin Core archive has been developed together with, with GBIF to export all the occurrence data into, into GBIF. So there explains, this might explain some limitations there are. Then we have an API, which if you're interested, we, I mean, that you can use, and there's also the the, the chance or the, the uh, possibility to extra, extend it or make it more use for use for you. So if you need data in a particular format for your use, please let us know. So what? So this is closest the loop. So we are back to the paper, and what um, Debbie already showed: use the Darwin Core archive. So the conclusion I want to draw is that Darwin Core archives are just one access to database. It has been produced for GBIF. It might not be the best for you. So please explore or talk to us what's best to use. If the API might be your starting point. Thanks. Thanks very much, Donna. Thank you. Um, we are at this point uh, right on time. We have the next 15 minutes for discussion, for questions, uh, aha moments. So for, like I said, for many of you, quasi was not new, but for others it was. So you may have quasi questions or you have questions about Taxon Works or what James and what Jim and I did. Um, so we are open to those. I want to follow up with what Donna closed just briefly and mm. to re you've heard me state it, but I need to restate it again. Internally, when we develop things as, as developers and a team in the species file group, we're, you know, I, I'll, I'll show later that we have 700 requests for functionality and bug requests, et cetera, on our issue tracker. So we have far more work than we can tackle. And so we internally juggle a lot of what's going on um, in our broader community. We think about what that sort of juggling is doing in order to prioritize things. But my take home from today's talk right here is that it's researchers. It's not Donut's team. It's not our team. It's researchers like Jim and Debbie that did the experiment, that engaged and they, they tried to use the tools that were available, they're going to drive um, the process forward. They're going to drive the process by coming to Donut, coming to us. Um, I can go to Donut and say, Donut, you should make this API and that API. And he can come back and say, you should make this structured data and that structured data. But at the end of the day, what really gets us going is when the researcher comes to us and said, this is going to change my process. This is going to change how I do things. This is going to change what I can do. So um, I'm encouraging everybody. One of the things that was very interesting to me on that poll is that after anybody, if you've published a modern taxonomic treatment in the last couple of years, Plazi has parsed you. But we saw zero people as taxonomists went to see what your data looks like in Plazi. So that's a really that's a really great moment to see what you look like to the rest of the world and to see how Plazi is magnifying your voice and to think about how you can take advantage of that as a researcher in what you need to do to promote your work, to encourage others to think about the fairness side of it, et cetera. Um, so we can build things till the cows come home. And I would like to ask Donna at some level, how has AI changed you know, your thoughts about processing all of these fields? They could go off and experiment like mad on using large language models to replace Golden Gate, 
But is that helping their researchers? Is that going to help Jim on a day-to-day -day basis? Is that going to help the individuals um, do their work? So those are my observations there. So this is Jim Woolley. I, I can already see uh, uh, you know, a couple of things that we, next steps that we might be able to do even with the Galeopsomaya monograph, for example, if I'm understanding what the donut showed, they're parsing all the images out, you know, uh, species by species. And for example, in this particular monograph, uh, the, the, the plates are all at the back and you get you get page after page of like comparative, you know, views of, of uh, you know, lateral habitus for, you know, eight species and then the next eight species, and the next, it's an enormous amount of work for us to go through and you know, click all those things out with screenshots and enter them, and it's just so it's really prohibitive. Looks like it's already been done on the on the Plazi side. So, uh, pretty exciting stuff. Quick example to make the point for Jim, and we didn't go down that yet, but yes, exactly. So if we go look at the exact paper that we were talking about, Plazi processed it. Here's one particular name they pulled out of the paper. So if we go back, here's the paper. It's got 302 new names in it. Here's, the, well, and 324 treatments because there are some other issues there, like there's a key, for example. So if we go and look at a given name, it tells us it's a new species it pulled out of the paper and it occurs on this page. If we click and have a look at that. We can see the data they pull out. We can see this reference to figures that Jim just gave us. And if we go down to the bottom, indeed, we can see them. They are big. So they're going to load quite nicely here. They're also in this. Um, on Zenodo, this biodiversity literature library that do not uh, referenced, and then you can link to those. So yes, Jim, you'd be able to. Debbie, Debbie Donut, can you click on that link that Donut shared there and show them in Zenodo? Sure, you sure. Yes. Add it to the yeah, chat. You, uh, you, can, you can click on this image if you want. Yeah, yeah that's what I was going to do, and then it's fine. That's what I was. And then gonna we have do. a question from Gregory. I, I could click here, Matt, and go. Yeah, yeah. yeah click there. Is, hmm. Yeah, yeah, and then. Here we have the paper, and then if I go down, you see all the so-called related works. They're loading. So here's all the images, and then you can link to those. So they're in Zenodo. Um, it's a fairly a, a resource we could expect to be sustained for quite some time. You can link to those. Um, so let me stop sharing now, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, Gregory had a question um, in chat. He said, is it true that only published data is captured? There's a lot of unpublished data, for example, data on slides from the USNM white flag collection um donut i think you you could answer that how, how do you how do you prioritize what you guys parse like uh, current stuff versus historical stuff maybe is the question and the priority is to get as many new species in as possible which are produced every day so right now there's something like nine thousand we get and sort of moving on the front and then the next one is to to get as many, discover as many species as possible. So that's another, like take big journals like Sue Texa or others, which produce a lot. And then do projects, like do we do, right? for example, one on Cicada, then take, take all the Brazilian Cicada literature and extract everything. So that's more project driven. And the other one is right now operational to see that we, we can move, we can actually convince you that's important to to, uh, <clears throat> to get all this data accessible. So we focus on published data. We don't do great literature, we could, but we, I mean, it's an overwhelming task and we can't. I mean, there's, there are like 50 million pages in VHL, which are waiting or, or Jim has like 20,000, which is about 400,000, 500,000 papers, uh, pages in, in, in his, his calcite data and so on. Greg, let us know, Gregory, let us know if that helps answer. And Dimitri has his hand up with a question too. Um, can I, do you hear me now? Yep. Um, yeah, I guess not my point was, you know, we have a, a lot of post distribution data that's unpublished. And if there was a way to capture that, that would add a lot to our knowledge of the whole system. You know, and we could also capture in a, in a database, uh, the natural enemies, and uh, have all that information available other than just uh, 
the taxonomic, taxonomic information. And I was wondering if that can be done. Don't Maybe I, I can answer this briefly. Yeah. So from our point of view, the most important thing right now is to get these taxonomic treatments in because we have a problem. And the problem is that we have, we create a lot of digital data now, that's, that's DNA data, barcoding and all, seed and science data. And sometimes they refer to names, taxonomic names. And that's sort of the only way that this new taxonomy is link, being linked to the linear taxonomy. And I, we believe that unless we really make these names citable and, and not just a name, but the taxonomic concept cited by the identification, then we probably might lose a lot of this, the published records. And if you do if you do biotic interactions again, you have to know which is the taxonomic name to which concept does it relate to, and Jim is very well aware of that because a lot of these identifications are misidentification in calcids. So unless you really can go back to the specimen and you want to know understand which concept has been used for identifications, you're not able to make these fantastic biotic interaction links. And I just want to add to that, that TaxonWorks has separate concepts from names. And this, this is a bit of a mental hurdle to get across, but we can, when we tie biological data, like interactions data, two things, we tie them not to names, but to, to concepts. And those concepts are linked to names. So um, if we really want to do what Donut was proposing, our data models have to be more abstract in some ways, yet not more prohibitively complex in the user interface. And this is a big challenge for people um, who are capturing new data, who want to share new data in that way that uh, Donut um, envisions. Dimitri, you had a question. And, and I want to add, Dimitri, jump in. There's also a question Derek Sykes asked in the Q&A. Matt, maybe you can look at that. Dimitri? Yeah, I'll get to it. Yeah. Go. I have two questions, one to Jim, one to Debbie. Just make uh, it quick. Sure. Uh, so, Jim, you capture a lot of data besides just nomenclature. You get distribution records, biological association, um, type material, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, post processing of the data after plasia, um, how do you feel? How much time do you save on uh, going through the plasia processing? And for Debbie. Did you guys try to do, did the paper not have just only a, a new species name, but also a synonym, new combination, et cetera, et cetera? How well your mechanism will work on processing that kind of data? Uh, in short, I don't know. I know that there's a possibility, but we don't have that I know of. I don't think we can add synonyms yet. I'm not sure Dash added that checklist. We ignored yeah, I, those, Dimitri. The main thing in this paper was new names. And yeah, we just tried to get the names for this experiment. Uh, this is Jim Woolley. Uh, you know, when I said that we were caught up with the taxonomic literature in Chalcedonia, I, I meant papers that have, you know, new taxa, nomenclatural actions of some sort. We have a backlog of something like 500 papers with biological, you know, host information, uh, distributional information, you know, all sorts of stuff that we just are unable to deal with. And, uh, you know, it's very, that, that, that information is very, very important to people like Greg Evans, you know, and biocontrol researchers. So we're hoping that at least some part of that, we may be able to parse using, you know, something like what you've seen, seen this morning. And certainly the distributional information I think is, is, is there host, uh, you know, parasitoid host relationships, maybe not. The, to add to that, I think you just alluded to that, Jim. Other data like repository, there are some other pieces that uh, page numbers, the source citation that do not, that Plazi and the Plazi team that's here, by the way, all of you, thank you. There's more Plazi members here. Um, they capture that already. So we could pull in that information as well to reduce the number of other information that has to be added. There is some data that Posi does not um, pull out specifically, so we would still have to capture that. Um, but we, we can provide you. We can provide you in each stream and a list of specimen or other species cited. 
So yeah. we we extract we extract taxonomic names in, in images and we get them. So from that point of view, you could get a list of okay, <clears throat> here is a treatment in S this and this uh, taxonomic name included. And then it's up to you to decide is it like the comparison because it's on generic or is it host whatever host parasite relationship or so? Two minutes. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Don. Um, Jeff, I think Gregory has left, but I would like to say thank you to him and we'll hopefully can follow up on some of the questions he was asking. Um, and I think there's one from Derek in the Q&A. Um, so those of you who click on the Q&A button, I think you can see the question for yourself. If GBIF is ingesting new taxon names and relationships, for example, synonymies via Plazi, it sounds like it's very up to date on taxonomy and classification. Is there an estimate of what is being missed uh, percentage-wise? I hear people complain about GBIF taxonomy being unreliable, but it sounds like it's as good as a global machine-based system can be. Um, is there a, go ahead, Donna. Um, I'm not sure whether Marcus is here. You could probably answer that, that question. Yes, I think Marcus will be here tomorrow. Uh, is there a I mean, it looks like he's here as well, so, or not? But the same, what we do, we we export all the treatments and the, the synonyms into Checklist Bank, so we can get them. And that's one of the strengths we have because the the relation, the treatments have relationships, and the relationships represent the also the synonyms. So relationships can be it augments, like it says, okay, this treatment adds something more to an old treatment. Or it says, no, in this treatment, I make a, a synonymy. So uh, a name disappears. And so you can type these relationships. That's what we do. We can go into synospecies and explore. That's where our tool to visualize this. Uh, maybe you can put a link in the chat to yeah. that, where that is. For your time. Synospecies. Thanks, yeah. Jeff. I think yeah. I tried to get most of the links that Donut referenced in chat, but yeah, yeah. we could re we could re-add them That's or in the Google Doc. Yeah, there. thanks, Donut. There we go. Um, I want to say thank you, yeah, Matt, too, um, to Donut and to Julia and all of the Clausy team. Uh, yes, thank you, Davide. I see you found the reaction button there <laughs> in Zoom. Um, I think we could talk for hours about this topic. Uh, I think it's definitely struck a chord and we look forward to working uh, to make the connections uh, more fruitful so that everybody can benefit from them inside TaxonWorks and beyond.